Okay. <laughs> I think other people are trickling in. Hold on. Aloha. My name is Sergeant Green with the Kauai Police Department. Thank you for being here at our presentation for keeping our kapuna safe. Uh, I'll be going first, and then uh, we're going to have Inspector Langstaff from the Kauai F uh, Fire Department also giving safety fire prevention uh, tips. It's a little bit of, bit of a background about me. I'm originally from Chicago. I um, spent uh, 11 years working for LA County Sheriff Department, and then I came over here to Kauai. My wife is a local girl, so I met her on the mainland. Um, one of the main reasons that I wanted to come over here and, and move here was because I felt like when I came to visit Kauai, I saw it as being kind of a pure, in a sense, uh, still tame place, and I saw what LA had become. So I wanted to try to preserve what Kauai is and wanted to raise a family here. And one of the main things is definitely we want to keep our kapuna safe. So with that, uh, what I want to talk about initially is home burglary prevention. And uh, first of all, burglary is a crime of opportunity. And uh, the bottom line is you don't want to give any suspect a chance to get into your house. So you want to make their job as difficult as possible. So we do that with uh, burglar alarms, having good neighbors, um, barking dogs, things like that as a deterrent. So basically there are what we call the three D's of protection and those three D's are deterrence, uh, delay and detection. Deterrence uh, can be good lighting and one of the things that I always suggest is having uh, motion sensors. A lot of times you have a motion sensor and someone will see that they don't know if someone is really home or not so that's always good to have. Um, like if you go away for a while you don't want to have the light on constantly because if it's daytime then people know, okay, their lights are on, no one's probably home. Um, you definitely want to alert your neighbors. I saw someone had a neighborhood watch pamphlet, excellent. And uh, after my presentation, if anyone wants to come and see me inside, I can talk to you about starting up a neighborhood watch program. But that's always good. Uh, you want to have sturdy doors, windows, and locks. I know here on the island, a lot of us have jalousies for windows, which can be pretty easy for criminals to slide the jealousy windows out. So that's something you might want to look into. Uh, the second D that I mentioned is delay. Uh, good home security will slow a burglar down. They don't want to waste time or expose their intentions for long if they can't find an easy target. So um, a few minutes delay, an alert neighbor, and then they're going to be caught. Uh, also detection, as I mentioned earlier, a barking dog. It doesn't have to be a big pit bull, Rottweiler. You can have the little chihuahuas, and they make just as much noise, and they do just as good of a job. Uh, you want to have, wh what I suggest is if you have brush around your house, that you, you keep it low. Because if somebody wants to come and enter your home, a lot of times high shrubbery is good for them to hide. So if a neighbor comes and, and they see that somebody shouldn't be there, then they can call the police themselves or whatever you they can do. Um, make sure you lock your doors and windows. I know we live in the Aloha land here. Unfortunately, everybody doesn't have Aloha in their heart. And we all know that. Um, if you're shopping, and this is going away from the home, but as I'm thinking of it, if you go shopping, I go to Safeway Foodland, I see women with their purses, they leave them open, right inside the cart, they walk away. This isn't the way it used to be. So. Unfortunately, there are bad seeds out there, you know, and it's not running rapid, but it takes that one, two percent that messes it up for everybody. So we don't want to give people a chance. Uh, you definitely want to lock your doors and check your windows before you go to sleep. Uh, and it's always good to leave a light or radio on inside of the house. Um, if you're going to be gone from your home for a long period of time, in addition to having like a motion sensor, like if you're going to go on vacation, I suggest putting a stop to your mail. Um, definitely have, if you get a newspaper delivered, you want to stop the newspaper. You don't want to have anything piling up there. So basically, make a long story short, you want to make sure that the house looks lived in. Um, if any of you have like ladders around the exterior of your home, that's definitely a no-no. You, you don't want to have it visible because I've seen cases where criminals 
you're giving them an opportunity. You got the ladder right there, they use it, they get up on a second story, and then you're wondering how they got there because you gave them the opportunity to do that. So we want to keep that to a minimum. Um, even your vehicles in your car, in your driveway, we've had cases where people, suspects are entering uh, people's cars and they feel like because the car is in their driveway that nobody will actually come in. Well, they do. Um, some people, out of convenience, they leave their cars at the ignition. For the life of me, I can't understand why, but it happens. Uh, the best crime prevention that they say is ever has been created is a good neighbor. So I think it's important to have a rapport with your neighbors, and I think that's one of the advantages that we have here on Kauai as opposed to the mainland. Um, unfortunately, we can't be, and I say we, law enforcement, we can't be everywhere at one time. So with those three Ds that I mentioned earlier, it's going to help delay, you want to deter, and uh, the third D is detect. Um, as far as if someone ever does break in your house, just by a show of hands, has anyone been victimized here? Okay. Well, that's good. What, what I brought with me today, and I'll pass this out, you guys can pass it around, is um, something to list your personal property. Now, God forbid you guys ever get your houses broken into, but it's a good thing to have all your credit card numbers written down somewhere, any serial numbers. And what this is here is a list that you can uh, put all your personal property on. So I just want to hand this to you folks. You can pass it around. And then if you have neighbors or relatives that you want to give it to also, that'd be awesome. Make copies of it. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to touch on uh, as far as protection, and, and this is kind of a, a touchy subject for some people, but a lot of times our own relatives come into the home and they can be suspects as well. So what I'm, what I'm talking about now is like maybe identity theft. You want to keep your credit cards and things of that nature hidden. Um, another big thing that we're finding is painkillers. A lot of the kids and a lot of people are addicted to painkillers. So whether it be Oxycontins or Vicodin or any type of painkillers, uh, even on the mainland, one of the latest trends now is for the kids to, to use uh, cough syrup, cough medicine. It has the codeine in it. So that's something that you want to be mindful of. Um, it, it's scary, and I don't, I don't mean to alarm you folks, but it's a reality, unfortunately. Um, real quick, before I go on, uh, I want to talk about construction scams that, that we've seen here on the island. You might have people going around, and they offer that they can do uh, construction work for you, or they'll, they'll do this and that for a really cheap price. And with the economy being the way it is, it seems like something that you would really want to look into. My suggestion is get references, even if it's a construction company that's reputable. You want to make sure that they have a license and you want to make sure that they have references. Because you got these people that are fly by night that come by and they give you this great deal and they're talking, oh, auntie, uncle, and they smooth you. And then next thing you know, you've given them $5,000 to do a job and they're gone. So you definitely want to avoid that. That is the actual case that we've had here on Kauai. So you definitely want to be mindful of that. So like I said, you want to ask for references. You want to make sure that they have a, uh, a licensed contractor. Um, the last thing, I don't I want to take up too much time because I have to give it over to the inspector for the fire department. But I do want to touch on um, elder abuse. I think it's a real important topic and it's kind of dear to me because there's different types of elder abuse. It could be physical, it could be emotional. Uh, basically, elder abuse is, you know, as elders become more physically frail, they're less able to stand up to bullying and uh, being able to fight back if attacked. So they may not see or hear as well as, you know, that they may have in the past, which leaves openings for people to take advantage of them. So the different types of elder abuse, like I said, um, can be intimidation, it could be threats against the elderly, it could be actual physical abuse, um, that it, shoving, hitting, um, a lot of times it's actually caregivers, believe it or not, that are the culprits of this. 
And it may not even be the intent of the caregiver that's doing it initially. They may just be frustrated with the person that they're taking care of, and then they shake them or they do whatever, but that's still elder abuse. Um, you have the emotional abuse, uh, intimidation through yelling or threats, and that's something that I've personally seen here on the island, and it burns me up. Uh, humiliation, ridicule, uh, habitual blaming or scapegoating, you know, those are things that you definitely want to look out for. Uh, there's also nonverbal psychological elder abuse, and that can take form of like ignoring the elderly person. Like sometimes I, I've gone to, I don't want to name any places, but I, I've gone places before and have seen elderly crying out for somebody to come assist them, and then the staff just ignores them. That's a no-no. Um, isolating an elderly person from their friends, from their activities, things like that. And then you've got neglect or abandonment of caregivers. I'll give you a, a short story. Um, my mother-in-law, uh, when she was still alive, we were living on the mainland, and she was staying at this one particular hospital. She was bedridden, and she had bed sores on her that it was so bad that it had gotten down to the bone. It was hideous. So, you know, we're entrusting that these facilities and these caregivers are doing what they're supposed to do, but if we have people that are there in a, in a care home, it's up to us to make sure that you know, they're being okay and watched over. I, I also remember, and this was at a hospital, where they were releasing her, and they left the needle, they drew blood, they left the needle stuck in her arm. So, you have under and it's no excuse for that. I mean, you have facilities that are understaffed, and I understand that, but I feel like our Kapuna, they've invested so much time and, and they've built a certain level of clout that they should be treated like royalty. And, and I just believe that until, until I die. I mean, I just feel strongly about that. Um, aside from that, also, you have the financial exploitation which is important, and that goes back to the identity theft. A lot of times, people leave their purses open, and they'll get a, a bill in the mail, and they'll say, well, I never opened this account, and I still have my credit card. And they're trying to figure out how did somebody get all their credit information. Well, it's because your niece, nephew, grandchild, whoever, who's had access that you have total faith that, you know, they have the right to be there, they've gotten that information, and then they've used it. So that's something you definitely want to be careful of. So um, I don't want to take up too much other time. Uh, real quick, if what I would say is if anybody here knows of someone that's an elder that could possibly be a victim, or if you yourself get to that point, tell somebody. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Call 911. If you're, t if you're with your doctor, if that's the, the only time, if you've been isolated, Tell your doctor, hey, this is what's going on. I need you to report this. And then they're going to be bound by law to report it to us. So, like I said, uh, Inspector Langstaff is next. If you guys have any questions at all, you can come see me inside of the booth. I thank you for your time. And uh, aloha. Brief intermission when I get... Hello folks, I'm Curtis Langstaff with the Kauai Fire Department. I'm an inspector. I've been uh, with the fire department for about 13 years. And in that 13 years, I've worked on every single station on the island except for the brand new one you see outside of Kalia. We call it Kaikea Station. Have not worked at that station yet. Um, the last uh, five years prior to coming into the Prevention Bureau, I was working with the rescue located here in Lihui. And during those years, I've been to a lot of different fires. I've been to uh, brush fires and house fires and car fires and brush fires set on by car fires and boat fires even, um, and been to a lot of them. And I've had the experience of, you know, putting what we call putting the wet stuff on the red stuff and putting out the fires. Now, in the Prevention Bureau, one of my biggest jobs and responsibilities is to make sure that, you know, fires don't happen and try to prevent them from happening. And also what I get is the, the call in the middle of the night that we've had a fire, can you come and investigate it? So it's kind of fun. It's not fun being woken up in the middle of the night, but it's kind of fun to come in there with our flashlights and looking around and digging through all the rubble and trying to find out exactly what we're origin and cause investigators. 
So what we want to find first is where the origin of the fire was, and sometimes it's not as easy as it would appear. And then we uh, sift through the rubble to find the cause of it. And one of the things that I think is vitally important for our kapuna and for everybody on the island is to know how the fires are starting so that we can prevent them from starting in the first place. Um, and the examples I'm going to give you today are from here, from your neighborhoods, from Kauai. They're not things I pulled off the internet or things that happened on the mainland. They're things that happened here. Um, and uh, so I want to make you aware of a few things, okay? So one of the things that causes fires is uh, improper use of this. Anybody got one of these plugged in at home right now? Okay. A lot of times what we do is we, we, this is, you know, an extension cord. And the way an extension cord is intended to be used is you plug it into your outlet and you plug it into your tool or whatever you're going to use. And when you're finished, you unplug it from the outlet and you take it away. It is not supposed to be permanent wiring. And a lot of people use it as permanent wiring. You know, they string it over doors and through holes and things like that. And what happens to an extension cord over time is this insulation that is around it breaks down. And uh, when it breaks down, you may get what we call a fault arc. Uh, the two wires in there may uh, come in contact with each other or close to each other. It'll create heat. Now, if that happens to be underneath a, a blanket or a rug or something like that, it can create enough heat to actually ignite material and start a fire. Um, I, we have been to many fires that were started by improper use of extension cords. Okay, So um, we don't want people to use these um, as permanent wiring, but if they are using an extension cord, then to unplug it after they are finished. Um, if for whatever reason you have to leave something plugged in and using an extension cord, uh, the preferred method is the, um, the surge protectors, especially the ones that have a reset button on them. Because those ones, what will happen is if uh, there's a fault arc or if there's too much, um, a, an unequal current going through, the, it, it will trip. It has a tripping mechanism so that you'll know that it, it, you know, your power will go off and it'll stop power going to whatever it was supplying. Um, that will, um, one thing it will do is if you have to reset your circuit breaker often, it'll alert you to that you might have a possible electrical problem in your house. You might want to get an electrician to come in and take a look at that. So. Uh, the use of the extension cords can cause fires, okay? Now, if you use the surge protector, um, that will help. But we've had a fire started in downtown Kapaa, and the source of that fire was a surge protector. Now you're telling me, well, how, you know, you just told me to use surge protectors, but that causes a, a fire. But um, one of the things, what happens is the surge protectors, and everything we use, is made by humans. And sometimes they're made with faulty components and they're made in, uh, you know, and they have, um, they cause problems. And usually what happens is they come under recall. But I imagine none of you guys are probably going to have any problem with it because when you get your, your hair dryer, your coffee maker, your rice pot or whatever, and you buy it from Walmart and you come home and you take it out of the box and then, you know, you set it up and then you reach down into that box and you get that little three by five card that says registration. You guys all fill that out and send it in, right? You know, do you really? That's awesome. I don't. Most people don't. We don't fill out that card. And then what happens is that's under recall and it has a faulty thing and we don't know. And they don't know who bought it. You bought it at Walmart. Now I'll, I'll give you a, a really at home example. Did I just lose your mic? I did. Any place? I can put this mic any place. Sorry for the interruption, but there we go. Not used to wearing so much stuff. Okay. The hair dryer, I know you guys are thinking, what is he going to, you know, start doing his hair right now? But what has happened on this very island is, um, you know, uh, we had a, a lady that was getting ready for work. She plugs it in, makes herself look good, says, all right, I'm looking good. She turns it off, sets it down, goes off to work. A couple hours later, it starts off automatically, creates enough heat in the bathroom that it started a house fire and burned the house to the ground. And that happened twice on this island alone by a hairdryer purchased from Walmart. Now it was under recall, okay? It was under recall and, uh, and if she, you know, when you guys go into Walmart, you buy stuff there and you can see the recall notice behind customer service. <laughs> They've got them up there. So if something's under recall and you bought it from Walmart, but 
I don't look at that. You, if you fill out that card or you register your products online, and I really encourage you to do that with any kind of electronic product you're gonna get, especially a heat producing one, like a, a hair dryer, rice pot, coffee maker, things like that. You know, and of course technology is getting better and better and they're putting in safety mechanisms. Most coffee pots turn off after an hour and things like that. But they still, sometimes we, we do have fires that occur because of faulty electrical equipment. So really important that you, um, you, you take care of that stuff, okay? So here's a couple things that start fires. We got electrical cords, I'll give you an example. We had a, a home fire not too long ago where there was a carport next to the house and out there they, they had an outlet on the outside of the house and they plugged in their um, extension cord, they ran it out to the carport and they plugged it into a treadmill which is a little bit too much draw of power to be using an extension cord. But they plugged it into a treadmill and then they moved the treadmill so that it was on top of the cord pinching it. Then they left it plugged in and then they, um, it started to rain a lot and rain got in down in here and then created a fault arc, created heat and burned their whole carport down. Now, um, we're very fortunate and I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this, I'm very aware of it now that I'm in the fire department but for whatever reason, fires do not happen during daylight hours. They happen in the middle of the night when you're asleep. And that's when this fire happened, in the middle of the night, and they were asleep. Thank God everybody got out of the home okay. Because they were, um, uh, the woman, the wife of the house, they had three small keiki, and she woke up, looked out her window, and she sees like um, uh, just an orange glow, didn't hear any noise or anything. And she wakes up. And she goes out there and she sees, you know, looks around the corner and sees, oh my goodness, the carport's on fire, wakes up her whole family. Family can't even get out the front door because the heat is so great from the carport that they have to go out the back door and get out and they start moving vehicles and everything like that. Call 911, the fire department is able to come. Their house got scorched a little bit on the outside, carport gone, car that was in the carport gone. Of course, the treadmill, way gone. Um, but it, it was, um, you know, something that could have been very tragic in just a matter of minutes. And luckily that she woke up and was able to see that there was a fire outside um, and do stuff about it. Now, another thing, I'll give you one more. These are three um, leading, I don't, I don't want to say leading causes, but very prevalent causes of fires. So you, improper use of extension cords, uh, faulty electrical equipment. And the last thing is, there I go again. What am I doing? I'm stepping on this thing. I'm just making your job tough, aren't I? All right. This is supposed to be a match, a really big match. But what happens is, is um, a lot of fires are started by children playing with matches, playing with lighters. And it's not like they're you know, evil kids going around trying to light houses on fire, but as adults, um, what we teach them oftentimes is that fire is fun and safe. And how do we do that? Well, birthday candles, you know? Birthday, we, oh here, blow out the candle, we light the cake, we put the three little candles on there and it's so cute, the little three-year-old comes out and blows them all out. And so they think that they have a mastery over fire. They think that, oh yeah, I can control fire. And it's kind of fun. And maybe their birthday is a long ways away and they think, oh man, I, I want to blow out a candle. It's not my birthday yet. And they find matches or something. And so they light that on fire and they go, oh yeah. And then they decide it's time to blow it out. And it doesn't go out. Then they get nervous. Oh no, the fire's not going out. And they throw it in a rubbish can. Then they don't want to get in trouble. So they run away from that you know, and hide and pretend it never happened. Meanwhile, the rubbish catches on fire, spreads to the cabinet, spreads to the bed, spreads to the room. And we have a lot of uh, fires that are started by that. So I really encourage you. Um, man, I just lost that mic again. Sergeant Green did not have near as much trouble. Oh, around my neck? Will I hurt myself? Man, I'm not used to this high tech stuff. Um, but I really encourage you folks that when you, when, you know, I'm not saying don't light birthday candles. But share with the keiki that this little tiny flame can become a very dangerous, huge, roaring fire that can destroy all your toys. And then maybe they'll get the idea not to play with fire, um, not to play with matches. Encourage them to, you know, if they find matches or lighter, to give it to an adult, um, something like that. So those are three um, main causes. Now, fires still happen. You know, they, they, they happen accidentally, they happen for various reasons. And the, the next thing that's really important, what I'm gonna talk about is, is home safety now. Um, and a couple things that are very, very important. Now, I'm gonna bend down and get something here, and if I lose that mic again, <laughs> and you're just gonna have to fire me or something. 
All right, your trick worked, putting it around the neck there. Smoke alarm. Everybody got a smoke alarm in their house. I hope you have. If you are building a home right now, the county code would require you to have a hardwired smoke alarm in every room on every floor, okay, with a battery backup. Interconnected, meaning the one in the, you know, the one in the upstairs bedroom goes off, the one in the downstairs playroom goes off. Really helpful that way. Very important to have a smoke alarm. Now, the problem we have on quiet, and especially with our Kapuna, they're living in older homes, so maybe that's not hardwired in, but maybe somebody got them some battery operated ones, okay? And what happens is every once in a while you get the nuisance alarm, okay? The nuisance alarm goes off because somebody decided the only, you know, way to cook bacon is on high, right? Creates a smoke, the nuisance alarm goes off, it drives them crazy. Now, the Kapuna are not going to climb up on a ladder and just push the silence. If they're going to go up on a ladder to get their smoke alarm, they're either taking the whole thing down or they're going to open it up and they're going to take out the battery in it, okay? And th that happens a lot. They'll come in, they'll take out the battery, they'll close it back, okay? And it's up there. And you know what this is on your wall right now? If you got this up on your wall or up on your ceiling, it's a really ugly home de uh, decoration, okay? It is no longer a working smoke alarm. It has to have the battery in there, for, especially for the, um, the ones that are hardwired will still work, but the ones that are battery only won't work. Um, technology is getting better, you know? So we try to encourage people, there is, uh, ways to you get a smoke alarm that is less sensitive to the nuisance alarm. There's only two technologies out there that they use in the smoke alarms and I don't want to bore you with the details but if you look on the box um, it will tell you less sensitive to nuisance alarms. Uh, the photoelectric type of smoke alarm is less sensitive to nuisance alarm. The ionization tech, um, technology is uh, more likely to have nuisance alarms. Okay. And we tend to have a lot of the, the nuisance alarms in Hawaii. One, because the humidity sometimes sets it off. Uh, but like I said, also just any type of smoke. Sometimes the shower uh, can be so sensitive. But it's very important that our Kapuna especially don't take the batteries out. Okay? It's only going to work if you have the battery in. Now, you're also supposed to change the batteries in these at least once a year. Okay? At least once a year, change the batteries in them. Um, if, uh, and if it's over 10 years old... And here's the sound it makes if you, the battery needs to be changed. Just that little chirp, and it'll do that every couple minutes or so. But um, if it's over 10 years old, you need to change the, the, the unit altogether. Okay, they're only good for about 10 years. Okay. Um, the other thing with the, the smoke alarms, the technology is getting so good. You know, we've got a lot of homes with cathedral-type ceilings. And, you know, who wants to go up on a ladder and change the battery or, or go and address that? They have technology out there now that works with the most TV remotes. So that if you have a false alarm, a nuisance alarm, and it's going off, there you go. That's the sound of change the battery, okay? But if you have a, um, it going off because of a nuisance alarm, you can grab your TV remote, and you can press mute, and it'll di disarm it for about 7 to 10 minutes, and then rearm itself. So that's real helpful. That's a one that, you know, technology's out there. I just don't want anybody, anybody's home, and especially home of the Kapuna, to not have a working smoke alarm. You know, Hawaii has the lowest death rate per capita in the nation of people dying in structure fires. And there's a lot of speculation as to why that is. Um, our fires move very fast because they're very ventilated. Our windows are open, our doors are open, breeze gets in. The fire moves fast, but it also makes a lot of noise and wakes people up. Okay? But we do need the smoke alarms because they those give you an early warning to make sure that you can get out safely. I did say that we have the, the lowest um, death rate per capita in the nation, but unfortunately, one of my first um, months on the job, we did have a, a fatality in a structure fire. And I never want to go to that again. And that is something that a working smoke alarm could have probably prevented. So we encourage you, especially for the Kapuna, to get a working smoke alarm with a, um, make sure it has its battery in there. You can even get a battery that lasts for 10 years now. You've probably seen them at the store. Long life, 10 year lithium battery. Okay, that, that means you don't even have to change the battery every year. Okay, so you'll be good to go. Um, the other thing that is, is helpful to have, uh, the smoke alarm is number one. The other thing that is really helpful to have is we like people to have a fire extinguisher. Now you don't have to have one this big. Um, they make the little small ones and that's fine. We, we need to, uh, uh, a fire extinguisher is a very helpful thing to have. Now we don't want people to use these um, on big fires. 
It, it only needs to be a real small fire to use these on. And ideally, if it's something that uh, you know you need to use in order to get out of the house. The problem is, anybody here have a smoke or have a fire extinguisher? You have a fire. Where is your fire extinguisher, ma'am? It's small one. It's right next to my kitchen. Small one next to your kitchen. In the laundry room. In the laundry room. Okay. In your hallway, okay, that's pretty good. Anybody else have one? Well, it, I'll, I'll be the first to admit to you, I had one um, when I first bought my house. It, you know, it was a house was already built, and it had one, and it was mounted right next to the cabinets there. You know, so it was kind of like right here, perfect. And then the stove was right here, and I'm going, oh, that's great. It's right next to the stove. Wrong, not good next to the stove. And you know where most people in Hawaii keep them? Let me see. I got a fire extinguisher. Where should I put that? There's this. Oh, kitchen sink. Hold on, let me move the Drano. Let me move the cleaning supplies. We'll stick it in the back here. Oh, perfect. Yeah, there's my, smoke, my, my fire extinguisher. Well, let me just tell you, when your stove catches on fire and you go to get your fire extinguisher, ah, it's a little too hot. <laughs> you can't even get to it. We go to homes that are burned down. You know, they're gutted and fire all over the place. And then we open up underneath the sink and we see a, a fire extinguisher underneath there. Okay, so it, you want to keep it at least 10 feet away from wherever your stove is. And the reason being is because most of the fires, a lot of the fires start from unattended home cooking, okay? Very important. If we're cooking on the stove, that we stay there while we're cooking. If we leave the room, we turn it off. The problem is we live busy lives. Even our Kapuna got busy lives. They decide they're gonna heat up some oil and fry some fish. They put in the oil, heating up the oil, they're waiting. The phone rings, they go get the phone. Oh, hello, how are you? I haven't talked to you in so long. How are you? How are the kids? Okay, they walk into the next room. They're still talking on the phone. They go, what is that I smell? And they come back into the kitchen. Ah, they have a pan fire, an oil fire. Okay, and panic oftentimes sets in. What do you think when you think fire? Fire, I better put water on it. Oh, not a good idea with an oil fire, okay? If you put oil on, or if you put water on an oil fire, it will mushroom up into a big ball of flame. Many people have been disfigured, burned. It can even spread the fire into the cabinets. It's very, very dangerous. Um, what, how do you think you could put out that fire? Yes, ma'am, you could cover it. That's right. You could grab the cover, get it on there. What if you don't have a cover? What's another option? Salt or baking soda. You know, a lot of people think that, and I think that's one of those, those um, kind of continuing wives' tales. It's really not a good idea. Um, and it... it it's probably not going to put out the fire, and you also uh, risk, um, it, if the particles are dispersed just right enough, it might actually create a flame, a, a fireball, okay? So um, salt or baking soda I would not put on there. You can wet a towel and lay that over the top if possible. Okay, let's say it's an electric stove. What else could you do? You could grab your fire extinguisher. You could grab your fire extinguisher. Make a heck of a mess. It is corrosive to metals, but if it's starting to go to your house, yeah, you probably want to use that. What else could you do? You could turn it off, the electricity. Now, you're probably not going to be able to reach across the flames to turn off the knob, but you can always go to your breaker box, okay? <clears throat> and I suggest if you have a fire like that and you go to your breaker box, not the time to open it and go, let me see, kid's bedroom, washer and dryer, refrigerator. <laughs> no, just slap them all. Turn them all off and get that off, okay? So that's how you can handle that. The main thing is not to panic. Um, if you are going to put a cover or a towel on, if you can do it with an oven mitt, much safer to do it that way. If you have a gas stove, okay, you can always go outside and turn off the gas. You'll still have some residual gas in the line to burn out, but those are ways that you can handle it. The one thing that is most dangerous is panic. Um, panic is, is, uh, usually causes more problems you know, and than so if you can slow yourself down a little bit and think clearly, okay, a fire. You know, what am I going to do? How am I going to put this out? Okay. Now, of course, we also want you to call 911 um, anytime you have a fire like that. Now, you may think, well, okay, I've got a pan fire. And, you know, you call 911 and then you, you put it out. And, you, ah, who needs a fire department? I don't need those guys. I already Still let them come. You can always call dispatch and say, okay, I've, I believe I put the fire out. But could you allow, you know, allow the fire department to still come? Because we have uh, thermal imaging cameras. A lot of times fire goes into what we call hidden spaces. It'll go between uh, nooks and crannies and crevices in the wall, and it'll go in there, and sometimes it'll find a little termite pile or something like that and smolder for quite a time, sometimes a day or more, before it'll ignite again into a fire a day later. So we can come with those thermal imaging cameras and look through the walls to see if there's any places of hidden heat. Okay? So those are some really uh, important things. You know, These things can cause the fires, right? You can cause with uh, um, using uh, extension cords improperly. 
uh, faulty electrical equipment, kids playing with matches or lighters or fire, other ways of fire. You can keep yourself safe by using uh, smoke alarms. You can have a fire extinguisher. Wow, twice in a row I did that without knocking the mic off. I'm getting to be a pro. Okay, this and the last thing that is very, very so important, I can't tell you how important this is, and to practice with everybody that's in your, in your home and to at least um, even alert if you have somebody uh, spending the night, uh, even for a short time, is what we call uh, an evacuation plan or a safe meeting place. When people get hurt in fires, it's because um, the smoke alarm goes off, it wakes them up. And, and just so you know, fires, our experience with fires, most of us, is the hibachi or um, you know, the bonfire at the beach or something like that, where it's a nice, pleasant thing. A structure fire is not pleasant at all. The heat has nowhere to go. It hits the ceiling, banks back down. It's hot, it's dark, it's smoky, you can't see, you can't breathe, you're not even thinking straight because you're not getting that much oxygen because the fire is eating all the oxygen in the room. It's a very chaotic environment. So <clears throat> what happens oftentimes is, is people haven't practiced you know, any kind of evacuation plan or anything, and they get a fire, they panic, they don't know what to do, they bust out of the house. Now, I don't know about you guys, you, some of you guys have cakey, you have children in the house or visiting at times? Because what happens is somebody goes outside and they look for their cakey or their loved one and they don't find them and they go right back in. And that's when they get hurt. Okay, a lot of times it's not the, when they're in the fire for the first time, it's when they go back into it to find their loved one. Simple, simple solution to that is have everybody in your home know where you go in the event of emergency. You have the safe meeting place. It could be the neighbor's driveway, the mailbox. In my house, it's the trampoline way out in the middle of the yard. Okay, if, if I tell my children, if something happens, I don't know, one of the big Norfolk pines smashes into the house and the house is breaking apart, the house is on fire, um, something happens like that, we get outside and I go to that trampoline. Then I know if they're out. And the other reason it's really important, it's important for you to know your loved ones are out. It's important to us because when we arrive on scene, the captain wearing his white helmet is going to ask you, is there anybody still in there? And if you say, yeah, I believe there's somebody still in the back bedroom, it's a complete game changer for us. We are not as concerned about putting out the fire and stopping the fire from spreading at that point. We are concerned about life safety. That's our number one priority. We will put ourselves at great personal risk in order to, um, in order to affect the rescue. And we will go into a burning building if there is chance of a viable person in there. Nothing would be more tragic to us to go in and search for somebody and to have one of us get hurt because you didn't know for sure and somebody was out and they had gone to the neighbor's house. So you help us out a lot if you say, if you have that safe meeting place. Um, it really um, gives us security if you can, sta if you can state uh, with reasonable assurity everybody's out or there might still somebody be in there. And that will really help. So just to go over real quick, <clears throat> The things that cause the fires, okay? Using extension cords in lieu of permanent wiring, okay? These are only supposed to be used and unplugged if you're not there using them. Faulty electrical, electrical equipment um, that's you know plugged in. If you don't need it plugged in, don't keep it plugged in. Um, if you do need it plugged in, make sure that you have sent in the, uh, uh, the registration card so you know if it's under uh, any kind of um, warranty or any kind of uh, recall. Children playing with matches and lighters. Okay? Make sure that we're teaching our children the proper way to view fire yeah? and that they understand that this little flame or this little, you know, the hibachi, the warm campfire and the things like that can be very dangerous if they're not treated properly. Okay? Things to keep yourself safe. A working smoke alarm means it has a battery in it. Okay? Make sure it's got a working battery in it. Working smoke alarms alert you early so that you, um, it's basically a lifesaver. This is probably one of the most important things you can have in your home, okay? A fire extinguisher, okay? Will help you put out small fires, small fires. You don't wanna tackle a raging inferno with a fire extinguisher. It will help you if your exit is blocked by, a by fire, okay? And the other thing that is very, very important is for your family and everybody in your house to have a evacuation plan, a safe meeting place. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Yes, ma'am. Two bedrooms, and the 
one lets out onto a lanai, mm -hmm. which you have to climb over a railing mm -hmm. if you're on the first floor. If not, then you're two to four floors up. Uh, and the other bedroom has a very small window with dowels. Right. So how do you... You know, yes. If my fire is in my hallway, what am I going to do? Yeah, I understand. You're living in a condominium, second floor, a uh, couple bedrooms, couple windows. You got to go off a balcony. Um, yes. In in Hawaii, you you each home does need to have two exits. Windows are considered exits. Um, going off the balcony. Now, is that the best scenario? No. Uh, you may you know break an ankle, or hurt a leg, or something. But it's it's definitely better than trying to get through the flames. Yeah. If you had a um, extinguisher, you may be able to get yourself out that way. One of the things we always encourage people to do, if you, they do sell those little ladders that you can put on your balcony to toss over the side, so that you can uh, now, we just heard from uh, Sergeant Green, you won't want to leave that hanging out there all the time. It's a big invitation. Hey, come and take all my stuff while I'm gone. But uh, for getting yourself out, they have the ones you can toss over and get out. If you find yourself in a situation where you're in a, a second floor and uh, there's a fire blocking your exit, you need to go to the window open the window, grab anything you can, and wave it. We are trained as we approach a scene, especially if it's multi-stories, to look at the windows, to see if there's anybody there. Again, we see you in the window, you become our priority. We, the fire is no longer our priority. We wanna confine the fire to protect the area that we're gonna rescue. That's all we were concerned about doing, stopping it from spreading to that area and being able to affect the rescue. But those are the best things you know that uh, I could suggest. It is difficult if on the second floor, um, but you it, thinking about it is already helping you and that's one thing we encourage people to do and we do it all the time it's called pre-planning we come into a situation and we say okay if it really hits the fan here things go south really bad what's it going to look like and what are we going to do and that's why I, I really like people to understand that a structure fire what it's like because that is not the time to train how to get out of your house um, oftentimes the smoke is so thick and, and knocking you're crawling on the ground you can barely, if you lift your head up, you can't even breathe. I mean, we come in with full SCBA and everything, and it's still incredibly chaotic and difficult. Um, you can imagine what it's like in your home, so it's a really a good idea to think it through, like you are right now. Boy, if there's a fire in my hallway, how am I going to get out of here? Okay, and then that will become quick, and you'll you'll uh, put it into practice when you need it. Okay, but that's pre what we call pre-planning. Excellent. Anybody else have any questions? Um, we do not do home inspections at this time. No, we don't. Um, but we're more than you know willing to, to you know share information with you. Uh, we just don't have the manpower to go and do home inspections now. It is something we would like to do, uh, but uh, it, it's just a, a manpower issue and also a liability issue. Do you do um, any seminars at the senior center? We do. Um, oftentimes we do uh, seminars and, and we uh, follow around the Agency of Elderly Affairs and when they do their, um, their ID and oftentimes give safety presentations and stuff and, and share with them, yes. And it's a really good idea because like I said, the, the number one problem we have oftentimes is the kapuna taking out, you know, they don't want to hear this thing going off when they burn the bacon. So they'll just say, ah, and then they'll say, oh, bum by, I'll go change it. And they never do and they leave it up there, yeah. Um, and that's, like I said, you know, the, the most tragic situations we've been in, um, the, one I, the example I gave you earlier of the, the young woman who woke up her family to get them out of the house because of the extension cord fire. Well, when I have to interview uh, folks and I asked her, I said, well, did the smoke alarm, I see you have smoke alarms in your house, did they alert you to the fire? And she looked at me and she literally got tears in her eyes and she said, we just took the batteries out because we had a nuisance alarm. She said we had just, and she, her mind went ahead and did the what if scenario. And her three keiki were sleeping um, on, on the other side of that wall where the outlet was. And she was literally about five minutes away from the worst day of any mother could ever imagine. Um, and thank God she, she woke up and was able to alert her family. But because they had taken the battery out, remember, this without a battery in it is ugly home decoration. This with a battery is a life-saving life -saving tool. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate your uh, attention. I hope you learned something. Sorry for knocking off your mic the whole time. <laughs>